morning year 10 i haven't done a video for you yet well one that's worked so today i'm going to take you through the field mouse and i'm going to show you how to annotate the poem effectively and how to respond to the questions that are on show my homework so make sure you've got your copy of the poem ready and let's get to it okay so we're going to be looking at the field mouse by gillian clark and the work on Show My Homework today is exploring how the field mouse is presented and how the speaker feels towards the field mouse. So the first things that I'm going to do are, I'm a big fan of a table, I'm going to make a little table down here about the field mouse and the speaker. So, sorry, I'm just going to add that to dictionary. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the poem and then afterwards I'm going to add to this table with my ideas on how these two things are presented and how the speaker feels towards the field mouse. So as I go through, anything that I highlight um, will be for that table. I'll do it in a colour. So field mouse, I'm going to highlight in yellow. Speaker, I'm going to highlight in green. And I'll add some comments down the side as well. So, summer, long grass is a snare drum, the air hums with jet down at the end of the meadow, far from the radio's terrible news, we cut the hay. All afternoon its wave breaks through the tractor blade, over the hedge our neighbour travels his field in a cloud of lime, drifting our land with the chance gift of sweetness. The child come running through the killed flowers, his hands a nest of quivering mouse. Okay, so here we've got our first mention of the field mouse. Its black eyes, two sparks burning. We know it will die and we ought to finish it off. It curls in agony, big as itself. I'm just going to add that in there. And the star goes out in its eye. Summer in Europe, the fields hurt and the children kneel in long grass, staring at what we have crushed. Before the day's done, the field lies bleeding, the dust garden inhabited by the saved, voles, frogs, a nest of mice. The wrong that woke from a rumour of pain won't heal, and we can't face the newspapers. And all night I dream the children dance in grass, their bones brittle as mouse ribs, the air stammering with gunfire. My neighbour turned stranger, wounding my land with stones. So it's not a real um, obvious uh, presentation of a mouse. It's mainly within this second stanza, and you'll notice that I haven't actually highlighted anything green yet. Um, and so here I'm just going to change this bit to green and that bit to green. I'm going to add the bit here potentially in green. So what do we do now? We found our pieces of evidence. OK, so I told you I was going to be thinking about uh, these quotations and how I was going to put them into a table. Here you can see I've popped those quotations into the table in black. You can see that underneath I've also talked about what those quotations suggest. So on the left, this quivering, this verb or adjective, um, depending on how you read it, um, displays fear and anxiety, which isn't surprising for a field mouse as these large humans have displaced, moved it, and this is an alien situation for it. It's black eyes, two sparks burning. We've got the juxtaposition there, the black, the sparks, and the burning. Um, we, we could think about the sparks being hopeful, the anger potentially with spark burning, and even an evil sense of black. It curls in agony big as itself. It's in pain. We've got that simile comparing it to its size. Um, and the curling, it's a protective instinct as though it's hiding. The star goes out in its eye, a sense of hopelessness and loss. And that last one, staring at what we've crushed, this verb here, crushed, innocent, fragile, disposed, that it can be gotten rid of. Crushed, it's very easily um, killed and that it's innocent it didn't deserve it on the other hand the speaker we know it will die and ought to finish it off this verb that they know is suggesting the speaker is more intelligible intelligent knowledgeable and superior to the mouse this modal verb 
Uh, a modal verb is something that suggests necessity or possibility. So could, would, should, might, must. Um, this ought, they should, shows an element of humanity and compassion that they, they, they're trying to do something beneficial to the mouse. And finish, that it could be just disposed of as an object rather than as an actual living animal. It's black eyes, two sparks burning. Now we looked at that over here, but from the perspective of the speaker, this verb could be fear or rage or life burning in the mouse's eyes. And um, so that's a slightly different take of that. And this last part, staring at what we've crushed, this verb staring, it could show that they feel guilty, regretful, as though they are feeling remorse. And this collected noun, we, um, instead of I, it could be as though they're trying to reduce their responsibility. They're trying to say that it wasn't just them. They could be suggesting that it was a, it was a team uh, effort rather than their decision. Um, again, reinforcing if they feel guilty or not. So we've done um, these ideas about the field mouse and the speaker. We've annotated. Um, you could go further to annotate um, just general, which I think is always some great practice. So here could identify things like metaphor. Um, we've got here some uh, sensory language, which is where you use the senses. So we've obviously got the hearing aspect. We've got nature sounds um, being kind of converted into into music and almost uh, this element of war which is mentioned again down here down at the end of the meadow far from the radio's terrible news um, we've got a lot of pathetic fallacy mentioned here pathetic fallacy being the weather reflecting uh, the mood and so summer would naturally be happiness that that sun that warmth um, and again, warmth symbolises things like kindness, um, which is juxtaposed by things like terrible, um, as though maybe suggesting or foreshadowing something terrible is going to happen, um, such as the mouse's death, uh, which again is further juxtaposed by sweetness. Um, before day's done, the field lies bleeding, it doesn't actually. So again, we've got something along the lines of a use of personification. We've got uh, a rumour of pain, another metaphor here. Um, we've got alliteration, loosely wrong, woke. Uh, we can't face newspapers. Their bones brittle, we've got uh, alliteration there. Um, stammering with gunfire, metaphor, neighbour turned stranger, and wounding my land with stones. Again, we've got this uh, personification of the wounding land. Sorry, I've spelled that wrong. Getting carried away. Wait, there we go. Um, along with the metaphor of stones. Um, so it's always handy to go back and do those little pieces of annotating because it just reminds us of different language devices and how to annotate a poem. Okay, so the next part we need to think about are language and structural techniques. Um, just to remind us, so language techniques are things like uh, similes, metaphors, personification, um, again spells wrong, goodness me, uh, personification, onomatopoeia, and so on and so forth. Think, think, it could also be saying things like sibilance, assonance, etc, etc. Um, structural are, goodness me, I cannot spell, structural are things such as juxtaposition can be in there in terms of um, where things are, um, order of stanzas, for example, order or themes of stanzas. Um, you can also have things like a circular narrative can definitely come into poetry where the end reminds us of the beginning. It isn't in this case, but that's something to think about. Enjambment, where one line carries on over into the next, which usually can symbolise something carrying on. Um, so, for example, the wrong that woke from a rumour of pain won't heal that's a piece of enjambment there and you could think about the fact that waking it has 
it has started essentially and it's not stopping and it carries on with this rumor of pain won't heal so by carrying on here it suggests that this healing hasn't happened you could say that again we've got drifting our land sorry that's my emails um the drifting is carrying on over the hedge again carrying on um so that's something to think about you'll notice in our stanza that we're looking at there isn't a lot of enjambment there's a lot of end stop sentences and punctuations and sejuras used and we'll talk about why in a minute and um, so i will just add that in and i'm just going to mute my emails uh, so i'm going to add in the use of sejuras as well okay so we've got our quotations here what I'm going to do now is I'm going to label whether they are language or structure just with an L or an S beside it. So these ones here where I've got uh, verbs, collective nouns, juxtaposition, those are all language. OK, so just remember, if we're talking about things like verbs, adjectives, etc., that's all language here, though, in this juxtaposition. We could think that it's a structure technique because of how the words are laid out in the sentence. OK, thinking about that black comes before sparks and burning comes afterwards. You could have said black burning sparks in his eyes. OK, why have why have the words been ordered this way? OK, that's something you need to think about. Why has um, Clark? brought that adjective black first then sparks then burning what is more important what is um the main point of this here as well the use of enjambment at the end of this line it curls in agony big as itself okay so here we've got enjambment i'll put structural we've got enjambment here um so the agony could be carrying on the curling effect, which could be uh, mimicked by the enjambment as though it's curling, curling over the line, something to that effect. Um, the star goes out in its eye. Again, we've got an end stop sentence. OK, so I'll put structural again here. This end stop sentence, which is literally just with a full stop at the end. Um, this could be emphasising the uh, finishing, essentially, of the mouse's life um, and also reinforcing the loss of the star. OK, it's structurally replicating what has just happened. And it happens again here with crushed. OK, the structural technique of um, having an end stop sentence, end stop sentence. Um, it's emphasizing and um, mirroring the event that has just happened. Um, so again, you could say this exact point here for structural technique for this quote here. Um, you could also say here the black eyes could again be uh, brought over to this side. You could then look at here. We know it will die and ought to finish it off. So structurally, I'd be thinking about the cohesion of this sentence. OK, cohension, that's good. Uh, cohesion, that is where you talk about the connecting of something where something has been glued together in a particular way and the connection the cohesive device here is that connected and okay the cohesion of and um, makes it a compound sentence and the purpose of that is because they are justifying what they're doing they're trying to add that bit of information to make the reader think oh it's okay um so i've added a few structural techniques we've got our language techniques um where we've got the terminology here so we've got both of those so we've done question one and we've annotated our poem so this little bit of challenge here 
With any extra time, write up one of your ideas as a paragraph. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. OK, so my paragraphs always follow this technique, this um, terrible acronym P word. I've got point, evidence, analysis, writer and reader. Um, they don't have to be in that order, but that's just naturally where my brain tends to try and follow. Um, so I'm just going to use the first two uh, pieces that I've got here. Um, actually, I'm just going to use this one because I can show you how to talk about both language and structure. Um, I'm not going to include all the ideas because I'm just going to try and talk about one. Um, so I'm going to say that the field mouse field mouse and the speaker's uh, impression of it is evident in the poem through the line. We know it will die and we ought to finish it off. Now the only thing I haven't done there is make a really concise point at the start so I'm just going to go back and say um, uh, and the speaker's impression of it is made clear in the second stanza. This is evident in this is evident in the poem this is evident in I'm just going to get rid of that bit in the line we know it will die, we ought to finish it off. So I'm going to bring one piece of language and one piece of structure just because I want to make it a really good paragraph. So I'm going to say the use of the collective noun, I haven't mentioned this in this one, we suggests that the speaker could be acting uh, in a group uh, decision. However, they could also be relinquishing, I'm not going to spell this wrong, oh, relinquishing uh, responsibility for the killing of the mouse. This is supported by the structural technique using a cohesive device in the connective and to make it a compound sentence, adding in their justification to their actions. So a little bit wordy, not my best work. Um, and there are two things that I haven't done so far. So the field mouse and the speaker's impression of it is made clear in the second stanza. This is evident in the line, we know it will die and we ought to finish it off. The use of the collective noun we suggests that the speaker could be acting in a group decision. However, they could also be relinquishing responsibility for the killing of the mouse. This is supported by the structural technique using a cohesive device in the connective and to make it a compound sentence, adding in their justification to their actions. Good. I've done these three things. I've got my point. I've got my evidence in both language and structure. And I haven't talked about the writer and the reader, so I'm going to do that now. So Clark, I do believe it is with an E, yes it is. Um, so Clark is attempting to display an element of sympathy within the speaker. However, could also be suggesting that the speaker, a human, feels superior to the small field mouse. Readers uh, could interpret the speaker to be uh, less, no, uh, could interpret the speaker to be sympathetic towards towards the uh, agonised mouse, yet also 
feel that they are deciding its its fate for it. And um, again, very wordy, not my best work. And um, what you'll notice is that every time I talk about something, and I've done it, done it further up here in my analysis, I try to include two ideas. So on the one hand, they could be doing this, but on the other hand, they could be doing that. Readers could interpret it to be like this, but they could also interpret it to be like that. And the reason I've done that is because you are then displaying to your teacher, your examiner, whoever's reading your work, that you are able to comprehend more than one idea about something. It shows that you are able to extend your ideas that you've thought about more than one notion, and that will be rewarded. Um, so make sure you can try to do that if possible. Always try and think, well, what's the opposite to this? So we've had a go at this, we've done these two things. And from this, I would feel very chuffed at the amount of work that I have done. It's great practice for your Unseen Poetry part of your GCSE, along with general uh, writing exercises for the rest. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, make sure you go back through the video and pause if you want to have a little go at copying down some of my ideas. Please do not copy this, um, as I will no, and I will be so upset if you try to pass it off as your own. Have a lovely day. I will speak to you soon. Bye bye.